lot we're going to get through tonight, um, and there are different formats for different types of questions. So some of the questions will be asking um, candidates to agree by a show of hands, and we'll also have some audience participation with some of the questions too. Other questions, there'll be more of a discussion, um, and all of the questions have been um, sent in to Transition Bar through a crowdsourcing exercise, and the team at Transition Bar then looked at all the questions, grouped them, and have come up with these as representative <coughs> of the sort of issues that were being raised. Uh, the event is going to be filmed, um, and there will be the responses will be on the website. The website being democraticaccountability.org.uk. Or a link from or a link from Transition Bar. So we're going to kick off um, by each of the candidates um, giving a two-minute statement regarding their environmental sustainability and climate change policies. Now, I am going to be very strict on timing, so I will shut you up after two minutes. Um, so I'm going to start with those who were here, well, nearer the beginning rather than the end. So Lorraine, do you want to kick off? Okay. indeed it's a pleasure to be here this evening. Um, I found whilst researching for this evening's money, the meeting, like many of the general public I was not aware of some of the issues and if I'm honest all the answers relating to climate change and the environment. But what I did discover was that this is a both a fascinating and complex subject. The complexities of the answers to climate change results in a large proportion of the general public failing to engage with or understand the issues. But something that I'm sure of is that I'm definitely against fracking. If given the go-ahead locally, fracking could have a detrimental impact on our thermal waters. This very precious commodity provides so much to tourism industry in our city. Bath is becoming an eco-friendly city with new developments such as the T.R. Hayes showroom that taps into the geothermal springs that flow beneath Bath. However, historically, Bath has avoided making use of the natural hot water, and many buildings, such as Waterfront House in Bath, have a restriction preventing them from using the thermal waters that flow beneath the building. This contrast highlights some of the issues that Bath, as a World Heritage City, has to face in the 21st century. Across the UK, cities and towns are also tapping into European funding to enable them to provide eco-friendly solutions to everyday problems. And in our region, Bristol is recognised as a European green capital city this year. Bath sits in a valley which results sometimes in poor air quality. Research has shown that we have areas of the city where there is a high incidence of children who are more prone to suffer with asthma. I grew up in Whitcomb and my mother and sister suffered from severe asthma. But once my mother retired to Bath Ford, ironically her asthma improved. Education on the disposal of rubbish responsibility. I'm afraid that's okay. it. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, I have distracted with them <laughs> using some of my time. No, that's it. Thank you. Um, ben. Does someone want to take that yeah. away? Yeah, it's quite, yeah. Yeah. It's it's quite, quite distracting, way. actually. Yes. Can, can, can everyone hear okay? Yes, yeah. please, yeah. Yeah. please, please turn it off. Good. <laughs> Luckily enough, I've got a big booming voice, so you should be able to hear me. Um, since selected as the Conservative candidate for Bath in 2013, I made one of my firm commitments uh, in my six-point plan to tackle uh, huge amounts of air pollution levels that have inflicted Bath for a long period of time, and also to cut congestion in the city. 
And our transport manifesto we announced a couple of weeks ago really does commit to making sure we look at sustainable um, transport, uh, looking at sustainable transport measures to tackle things like uh, high to air pollution by uh, ensuring that we have an integrated bus service, by introducing things like smart car ticketing to reduce prices like happened in London with the Oyster card introduction, as well as integrating um, segregated cycle baths into our uh, bath transport system. And in addition to that as well, I committed to making sure that we protect Bath's beautiful landscape and setting, which uh, is under threat from uh, overdevelopment of the hills. And as you'll see in our manifesto when it is announced over the next couple of weeks, that uh, we'll be putting um, sustainable, uh, sustainable environmental issues at the very heart of our manifesto. In terms of climate change, um, it is one of the biggest issues that's facing the world at the moment. It threatens our global security and the long-term future of our planet. And we must take international leadership on this issue. We inherited a situation in 2010 where only 6.8%, only 6.8% of energy production was from renewable energy, which is, to be frank, a shocking figure. And we must be doing an awful lot more in order to make sure that more energy is being produced by renewable, uh, by renewable industries, and our Energy Act has gone some way in doing that. And over the last five years, renewable energies have more than uh, doubled. In terms of the sustainable environment, we want to see a reform to the Common Agricultural Policy to ensure a much Thank greater much, focus Graham. on environmental Sorry, protection that's, too. That's your Thank you very much. So, thank you very much. Um, I'm very much looking forward to this evening. Um, the environment is an issue very close to my heart. It's an issue I'm very passionate about. And one of the reasons I was initially drawn towards the Labour Party was the fact that we're a party that has always maintained a genuine commitment to the environment. I believe this is something backed up by our record. Um, and this can be seen by introduce, introduction of the Climate Change Act, um, investment in transport infrastructure. We also did things in government like enhancing the protection of wildlife through policies like the hunting ban. And while we were in government, we did actually double our share of renewables. Um, and we also cut CO2 emissions dramatically. In the future, this is something we would want to not only continue, but enhance. Um, and we also want to guarantee that Britain leads the global fight against climate change. We're committed to a decarbonisation target of 2030. Um, we want to expand and strengthen the Green Investment Bank. And we want to create one million green jobs by 2025 and also end the budget hole. Um, I also believe it's vital that our local commitment um, to environmental issues here in Bath is enhanced and supported by, by any MP. Um, Bath does face extensive environmental challenges such as air pollution, poor transport, which is also partly caused by um, congestion in the city. Now, I am determined to dramatically cut air pollution, something we have a national commitment to. I also want to continue to work to improve the transport infrastructure in the city and cycling infrastructure as well. We will be launching a, a cycling manifesto. Now, I really believe these are the policies that will lead to a greener Britain and a greener Bath. So I'm very much looking forward to this evening and Thank look you forward very to, much. to hearing from you. Okay, um, moving on to Julia. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I've done a few of these hustings already. I've noticed that it's very common for the candidates from the three legacy parties to tell the audience what they want to hear. But I'm not going to do that this evening. What I'm going to do is be completely honest with you about UKIP's policies and about what I think. Now, we acknowledge that climate change is indeed changing. It's done so for thousands of years and we can see clear evidence of that. However, we are sceptical about the extent of the human involvement in that. We're told that 97% of scientists are certain, if you believe the heavily discredited Cook report, or Barack Obama's tweets, then you are certainly going to disagree with me tonight. But the key thing here is that getting to the truth is becoming harder and harder. The science has been badly polluted by politics. Just last week, Al Gore said that climate change deniers should be punished 
And we've got scientists out there who are afraid to speak out in fear of ridicule, a loss of funding, or worse, death threats from those fanatical enough to resort to violence. And this is no climate for an unbiased science, in my opinion. And the awful irony here is that most of the efforts we've made in the UK and the EU to lower our CO2 have actually led to an increase in global CO2. What we've done is drive carbon production out of the EU to countries where the regulations are far less strict, simply offloading the CO2 to the consciences of India, China, the USA, and beyond. So what would we do as a party? We would quite simply scrap carbon targets. We would create a diverse energy market that utilised coal, nuclear, shale gas, geothermal, tidal, solar, conventional gas and oil. We would abolish green taxes to bring energy prices back down. The choice between heating and eating isn't something anyone in this country should ever have to make. Thank you very much. Hello. Now, um, the Green Party is the party of the environment, of course, um, but you might not have heard us, heard us talking about it recently, because what we're trying to get over with our message about social justice is because we think, actually, people know we're entirely pro-environment, hence the name, but the two are inextricably linked. And if I could just quote you the first, uh, the first core principle, the party is based on ten core principles, and our first one is, the Green Party is the party of social, social and environmental justice, which supports the radical transformation of society for the benefit of all and for the planet as a whole. We understand that the threats to economic, social and environmental well-being are part of the same problem and recognise that solving one of, those, one, one of these problems cannot be achieved without solving the others. Now, the key word there is radical, because actually we think that you can't solve the looming environmental crisis without radical solutions. Now, other parties sort of tinker around the edges to a certain extent, um, but I think you actually have got to, to <coughs> I am the Green Party, got to be entirely right. So we want to see things like reducing CO2 emissions to 10% of our 1990 levels by 2030. We want to completely um, reorganise re the uh, carbon trading scheme for the EU, so it actually is based on con um, contraction and convergence uh, concepts. And also we want to actually bring in tradable carbon quotas in the UK, so every adult is allocated some carbon credit, which is uh, something you can buy and sell. And that's the only way, actually, we'll keep our carbon credits or our carbon emissions as a country within acceptable limits. Now, of course, as I say, the environment and inequality and social justice are, are linked. You're not going to get people too interested about the environment when they're so poor they have to queue at food banks to get what they need to survive. So these things are, are the same issue, but actually you've got to talk about both to address the environment. And in Bath in particular, we've got real problems with pollution which is down to the traffic, and we, what we want to see is actually a radical solution to that. Something like um, cutting all the cars that come into Bath unnecessarily with something like a congestion charge. So, Thank you very much, Dominic. <laughs> we'll talk about that later on. Um, and finally, um, Steve. Thank you. Before I start, Chair, can I just please cover that, because I'm yeah. absolutely blind, otherwise it yeah, to I think I think you have a rough idea. Right, right. Up there. Yeah. Um, and I'll start my clock from there. Excellent. Uh, in 1986, as a young boy, I used to regularly organise a group of friends of mine to go out and collect empty drinks cans from around our city and get them recycled. Um, in those days, nobody talked about climate change, but I knew, and I was convinced, that we were facing an environmental crisis, and I wanted to do my small bit to help on that. Fast forward 29 years, and my zeal for environmental activism has not diminished one bit. I am convinced the greatest threat we face as humanity, as society, is not terrorism, is not our economy, is not any foreign government. I believe it's man-made climate change and that governments and society must do all they can to take that seriously. Now, I'm far from perfect, uh, but I am a lifelong environmentalist with solid green credentials, which I hope to outline to you this evening. And like many of you, I've been active in Transition Bath, in my case for the last three years, and as all you do, I try and live out my values as much as I can. But I'm also clear on where I stand on key environmental issues. Because there is solid green water that divided myself and some of the other candidates here with genuine hopes of winning the last seat. I am opposed to nuclear weapons. I am opposed to fracking anywhere. I am opposed to fox hunting and the flawed science behind our bad logical. And I am determined to deliver credible, workable and green solutions to tackle past long-standing transport challenges. Now, this evening, 
I hope to show you that I understand the environmental challenges we face and possible solutions to them. I hope you see the real passion I have for tackling these issues and that I see climate change as an opportunity to reorder our society in a better way. For I see the role of MP as one of civic leadership. And my vision for Bath is very simple. I want this to be the UK's greenest city and a hub for green jobs. Finally, as, and sadly, as a result of the hard cold reality of the city's demographics and the UK's antiquated voting system, if elected to represent Bath for May, I genuinely believe I would be the you. greenest MP this city Thank is ever likely much. to see. Thank you. Lovely. Okay. Um, that's great. Thank you all very much. Um, I'm sure the issues that you've raised will crop up later in the evening as well. So the first quick fire question, well, series of questions um, are centred around fracking, which I think most of you have mentioned one way or another. So firstly, for the candidates, um, I'd like you to raise your hands if you don't support fracking anywhere in the UK. Don't support fracking anywhere in the UK. Thank you. Secondly, if you don't support fracking anywhere in Somerset, Unless they declare independence, you may assume my first one comes. <laughs> and lastly, if you don't support fracking in Bath itself. Okay, thank you all very much. Now, we're going to do this for the audience now, same um, format. So, can you all put your hands up if you don't support fracking anywhere in the UK? Oof. Could you perhaps reword that? I'm having trouble with the double negative. Do you oppose fracking? You oppose fracking anywhere in the UK. Yeah. Thank you. Do you oppose fracking in Somerset? It's true, it's true. It's the other way around. And lastly, do you oppose fracking in Mark? <laughs> Okay, well, I think that's pretty unanimous for last Yeah. Okay, um, having talked about fracking briefly, we're going to move on now to look at other types of um, power generation. So I'm going to ask the candidates to give me, in turn, and we'll start at this end now, um, their top four. Um, types of power that the UK should be investing in. And the list is, you'll see the list there. So, Steve. Okay, in order of my personal, do you just want the four and that's it? Yeah. yeah. In order of my personal priority, offshore, solar, hydro, onshore. Dominic? Dominic? Okay, sorry. Um, in no particular order, onshore, offshore, solar, and tidal. Great. In no particular order as well. Coal, gas, nuclear, <laughs> and so <laughs> <laughs> um, Onshore, offshore, solar and tidal. Beth? Uh, mine is solar, offshore wind, nuclear and gas. Um, and lastly, the rain. Thank you. Onshore wind, offshore wind, solar and hydro. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. So we're going to move on. This is another quick fire question. Um, would, and this again is, hold on, let me just get this. Okay, so this is a straightforward question for the candidates, and if you could raise your hands if you agree. Would your party support the government proposal to stop energy performance certificates rated F and G homes being rented out from 2018? Would you support that? We'd like to go a lot further, but I'll yeah, support yeah. it. I know. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Um, audience, can you answer the same question by show of hands, please? Can you repeat it, please? Okay. Yeah. Would, would you support the government proposal to stop energy performance certificates <coughs> rated F and G homes being rented out from 2018? Hands up if you support that. Sorry, I don't understand what you mean. No, I mean it's the worst. They're the worst. 
They're the lowest band of trousers. Yeah. 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 So, um, it's not, it doesn't really work that, does it? No. Um, it's all right. So, would you support the reinstatement of the requirement for energy performance certificates on listed buildings? This was an exemption which was introduced by Don Foster, our Minister for Buildings, in 2013. Sorry, do you want to talk? Yeah. In, uh, Don Foster, our MP, in 2013, removed the need for an energy performance certificate, in other words, how much energy a house uses, from listed buildings. So our question to you would be, uh, would, you re would you support the reinstatement of the EPC for listed buildings? Candidates first, starting with the right. Yeah. Oh, and well, Sam, yes, I have. It's Anne's 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 but there's, there's more you'd want to, to put towards that because of the listed buildings that they can't put double glazing in and be energy efficient. Well, so. the contrary, they can. Yeah. They can. I've done it. OK. Yeah, OK. Can okay. we just take, okay. take, yeah. take a show of hands from the, from the candidates? Yeah, that's still going, yes, if you support. Would support the reinstatement. Yeah, I'm still going, yes, yeah. And the audience? The audience. Great. What do you do with the listed buildings that can't be? <laughs> like this one. Yeah. You're in a great by listed building now. Well, 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 bear in mind, if you issue an energy performance certificate, you're issuing a certificate, it doesn't necessarily have to come with any penalties or anything. No, it, it starts by making the information not entirely available. Yeah, okay. We don't, this is when you move the computer thing so you can see the question, you can't read it. You move it, it's slightly. No, it's just a projector. Yeah, that's the trouble. It doesn't work. Got a bigger panel. What's the question? Yeah. Sorry, let's do this. Did you all shift up a little bit? Move to the left. Move to the left. I'm moving to the right. Yeah, that'll be a first time. I'm sorry. Okay, so we need to move on from that slide now anyway. Um, so we're going to have a brief candidate discussion on this issue. Um, so you're going to be allowed um, about 30 seconds each, I reckon. Sorry, I know that's not very much. But we need to get on. So, does the EU have a role in promoting the energy efficiency of appliances by ratings and bans? And we'll start with Lorraine. Oh, okay. okay. Um, I think there's a, a, a question that comes from that question um, with regards to is it the role of the EU, but should it not also be the role of manufacturers and retailers as well? So, um, it doesn't quite fully answer the question, but I think it does ask another question from that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're well within the time limit. Uh, <laughs> I learned from the start. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, yes, I think it does. I was at the uh, Southwest Low Carbon Forum uh, talking about sustainable transport a couple of uh, days ago, and it was a really interesting statistic that was used by the University of Bath to show that since the introduction of regulations surrounding um, high-emitting diesel-polluting vehicles that the change in the law has seen something like a 90% reduction in high levels of particulate, CO2 levels, and um, uh, other emissions as well, which obviously have a huge impact upon the atmosphere. Thank so, you very much. I think it does. Thank you. Um, Ollie? Ollie? Yes, um, I also think the EU has a, has a great role in promoting environmental sustainability as well. Um, I believe in the power of collective action. I believe that a strong Britain with a genuine commitment to climate change within the European Union with a similar commitment can lead to the global fight against climate change and promote environmental sustainability on a global level. Lovely. Julian? Uh, you won't be surprised to hear that I will answer no to that question. Um, I'm obviously not a fan of the European Union dictating uh, regulations to us. 
A lot of these regulations come from huge corporations that lobby the EU. They spend millions of pounds on doing so. So I would much rather see this put back into the control of Great Britain. Okay, thank you. Uh, Yes, of course. I think one of the best things the EU does is uh, this sort of thing. Basically, um, it's a large trading block. Britain can do it on its own. If we started trying to get manufacturers to come with ratings for things, we're too small. Some of them wouldn't sell their things here. So it's also useful. You can go anywhere in Europe and you know your A to G energy ratings for appliances. You know which fridge is the best. You can buy it. Simple. So I'm a big fan of it. Great. And C. Uh, yes, we've seen a difference it can make on things like cars, uh, white goods, appliances. I would absolutely disagree with the UK point. Uh, corporations oppose this sort of thing because they don't want people telling them to clean up their act. We need to reflect in the cost of goods, the external cost to society of the health and the environmental impact of cleaning up carbon. And also the last point I would make, climate change does not respect borders, does not respect boundaries. It's perfectly valid for Europe to take a leading role in addressing that. Okay, great. Uh, now, can we take a show of hands from the audience on this one? So, do you believe that the EU has a role in promoting the energy efficiency of appliances? Great. Pretty unanimous, I think. Again? Who doesn't? Who doesn't? Who doesn't? Who doesn't? Yes, of course. I suspect this is the, this is the UK from here. Uh, yes, we've got... James Dyson will probably in the EU recently. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, that's brilliant. Um, now we're going to have a question that's introduced by Paul. Oh, thank you very much. Shall I do it? Just, yeah, well, okay. Yeah, we have it coming up here. So, putting aside your party's policies on climate change prevention and mitigation, in the recent past, what practical things have you and your immediate family undertaken to address your consumption of fossil fuels and by implication your carbon footprint or footprints. And I'm Thank going to allow you 40 seconds for this. Each, uh, Steve, you can start. Uh, very briefly, a couple of practical things I've done. I've been driving electric cars for over 10 years. I'm pretty evangelical about them. I think they're great. You should have more of them. It keeps your carbon down much better you get around. I also cycle regularly in the city of Bath. I cycle here today. I cycle all the time in the city. And finally, in my previous property, I was able to install solar panels. Unfortunately, I can't where I live at the moment, but if I ever live in anywhere again where I can have solar panels, I will absolutely do it because I believe in locally owned, decentralised energy production. Fantastic. Uh, Dominic? Um, I've got those panels. All my energy is renewable, even the stuff I don't generate, but I tend to export. Um, I've done the thing that actually helps most of anything you can do, which is be vegetarian. Um, we don't ever fly. Uh, we, I really rarely drive, I don't have an electric car, but I don't think really I need a car to be honest. Um, cycle everywhere, everything I can do, recycle everything. I reckon my carbon footprint's pretty good. Jolly good. <coughs> and um, Julian? Right, my wife and I very recently bought a new house. Um, we've insulated the loft, we've spent money on a very efficient new boiler. We've got new radiators going in um, next week, I think, or the week after, um, to save us money on our gas and electric bills. Um, however, you know, in the name of honesty, I, um, I do drive a 300 horsepower car, and I um, have taken 500 flights, which were completely unnecessary for my hobby, which is parachuting. <laughs> Thank you very much for your honesty. Best policy, I find. Um, <laughs> so, the only policy. Say again? The only policy. No, 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 First and foremost, um, I don't have a car, um, so I walk everywhere, I cycle, um, and recycle as well. Um, unfortunately, we're in a property where um, you can't uh, install solar panels. Um, it's, a, it's a great one this the building, but, um, uh, so, but I, I do as much as I can. Great. It's quite a difficult to answer this question, actually, because I've been recycling for donkey's years and also changed all my light bulbs ages ago to make sure they're all energy efficient. Um, I don't own a house at the moment, but if I have an opportunity to do so, I would love to buy somewhere near Western Riverside, which obviously has a sustainable energy plant there. Excellent idea for the future. Um, one thing I have done very recently is start food recycling, and everyone else in the area where I live um, have just started to do exactly the same thing. Thank you. Um, Lorraine. Thank you. Um, my family and I have been recycling for years because we 
lived in, I was born in Bath, so we've always lived here, and that was encouraged even by the previous council for recycling. Um, encouraged my children to cycle. I'm very fortunate that in my ward of Newbridge we have the Bristol and Bath uh, cycle cycle path, which um, which so many people enjoy using. I don't drive. I walk and use public transport. I've never driven. I've never even taken my test. So for me, um, I've got around this city for <clears throat> a amount of years um, without having to get in a car and drive. Thank you. Thank you all very much. So we're going to move on again, and this time we've got a question that's going to be posed by Karen Smith, who does. Oh, by Karen. Do you want to ask you energy efficiency? You probably need to come here and then be able to project your voice back at the audience, otherwise people won't. Use so Dick's magic oh, stick. It is on the wall. Is that right? Yeah, off you go. So should energy efficiency be subsidised? And also should energy supplies be subsidised either directly as in feeding tariffs or indirectly by tax breaks for oil and gas There's a few very small figures at the bottom. Um, I can read out. So renewables are subsidised about £3 billion a year. Um, nuclear is subsidised about 2.5 3 billion. 3.2. Uh, 3 Sorry, 2.2. 3.2. 3.2. 3.2. Uh, Excluding Henkley. 4.1. And um, Eco is 0.7 billion. Okay. Now, I'm going to give the candidates um, a minute each on this, and then we're going to open that up for some um, discussion with the audience. So, I think with... Uh, I think I'm starting to the middle. Do I start in the middle? Start in the middle. So, Ollie. Okay. Um, so, long time, I, I, I do believe um, energy efficiency uh, measures should be subsidised. Um, I actually believe all homes or new homes being built um, should be as energy efficient as possible. Um, in terms of giving tax breaks to oil and gas um, exploration, um, I'm completely in utterly against that. Um, in fact, in recent days we've seen the government give tax breaks um, to petroleum firms, which is absolutely terrible. It's a massive step backwards. Um, obviously we're committed to a decarbonisation target of, of, of 2030. We want to diversify our energy mix as much as, as possible. We want to expand the Green Investment Bank. Um, this is how we plan to encourage and ensure investment in renewables and in turn, obviously, as I mentioned in my opening statement, we, we hope to see um, is create over one million green jobs by 2025. Great, thank you. Um, Julian. Try this way, okay. Should energy efficiency be subsidised? No, I don't think it should. Um, and in terms of uh, the, uh, the tax breaks for the oil and gas exploration and various other um, forms of energy production, I would advocate the tax breaks because when we are overtaxing those industries, of course, um, that money ends up on your bill. And um, that's all I've got to say. Okay. Nice and short. Jolly good, thank you. And Ben. Sorry, I'm going to you know, move around. Switching around, but there we go. Um, <laughs> Julian, you're going to start sounding like Victor Meldrew in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> My other answer is yes, and the government is already doing so. Um, however, I think there needs to be a rebalancing. This is, I, I'm sure I'm allowed to say my own personal views other than the government's views here. But um, I agree with what Ollie's already said, which is that we should be subsidising to ensure that uh, housing ends up being as uh, zero carbon as possible. Introduction of the Green Investment Bank should be extended, and uh, it's a bit difficult for our party because we haven't actually announced our manifesto on this side yet, but no doubt that will be the case going forwards. Um, I would agree that we need to be reducing the subsidy for fossil fuels and increasing the subsidy for renewable energies, but the real answer is that without a growing economy, of course, we can't afford to subsidise anything anyway. So my main position is that we need to make sure that we end up with a growing economy in order to pay for these subsidies in the first place. Thank you. Um, Dominic? Um, well, to start by answering that, of course we can subsidise these things. I mean, you just have things like um, escalators on energy prices. There's all, all sorts of ways to do it if you've got political will. But anyway, yes, energy efficiency measures should be subsidised. Uh, things like people dying because they're too cold in their homes is ridiculous. Of course, we should buy our own insulation. I mean, it's absolute madness. I can't see how anyone can argue against it. Um, I think it's very important, actually, that this tiny text at the bottom that says, uh, 
externalities are you know, like deaths and stuff aren't included. Well, that's terrible. Of course, fossil fuels are massively subsidised anyway. Ignoring direct subsidy, we're paying for all the people dying because they're leaving all this stuff in. I mean, it's absolutely terrible. Fossil fuels should have a much more tax on them to subsidise the cleaner fuels. That's the only way we can ever have a, a world we can live in. Thank you. Uh, Lorraine, I'm going to open it up for some audience comments in a minute. Lorraine. Thank you. Um, well, yes, within uh, domestic, I think we have to encourage, though, the, um, the commercial businesses out there. I think believe that really they should be, um, it should be a business's goal to, to be energy efficient. Increasing the um, feed-in tariff for long-term contracts mm -hmm. to renewable energy producers, um, I, I think that's um, really important, but it was reduced by this present government in 2011, so um, there's a lot out there that could be done. Okay, and finally, Steve. Uh, short answer is yes. There's some really solid reasons why we should do this. Firstly, the biggest impact we can make on sorting out our energy crisis is demand reduction. It's by needing to produce less energy in the first place because we're, we're wasting less of it, leaving aside the, the costly angle of wasted energy. Secondly, and, and linked to that, this is a question for, for the economists out there about market failure. We currently have, as was mentioned, direct subsidies going into fossil fuels. We also have a whole host of indirect subsidies on terms of health, the environment. All these costs have to be borne by the state, borne by somebody. They should be borne by the people who are making the profit from producing them in the first place. Finally, in terms of that national level, uh, I'm really pleased. Liberal Democrats have a clear policy. And if we were in government again, within the first two years, we would introduce five green laws, one of which would be a Heating and Energy Efficiency Act to absolutely encourage this sort of thing. At a local level in Baines, we now offer 7,000 pounds to people to help them retrofit their properties. And finally, there should be no tax breaks on fossil fuel firms they, or nuclear. They are mature industries. If they, if they can't Thank prove the case by now, they much. shouldn't be subsidised. OK. Um, now, I'm going to take three contributions to the floor. If you could stick your hand up if you want to say something. OK, gentleman there with the blue jumper. Right, uh, my first question, uh, or related, on the energy subsidy. It's not a question. I want sorry, to OK, sorry. OK, sorry. No. Yeah. It's not a question, but a comment. Yes, please. please right. sorry, so, okay, no, 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 just a comment. Uh, energy subsidies, I would suggest to the panel that they uh, maintain and provide uh, inefficiency, inefficient use of, of energy, because you're kind of doing poor energy. If you've got a problem with the low income or the poor and those who, who are old, or use social welfare payments, don't use energy subsidies. The same applies, by the way, to water, which no one's mentioned this evening. And also related to that, the feed-in tariffs, that for, for, particularly for homes, um, well, that usually is going to go to the middle classes who can afford large Thank you very much. Except. I'm afraid that's your time up. And there was a, um, a woman in the front here. Oh, sorry, I, I wasn't taking a question. Okay, all right. Any other comments? Uh, yes, gentleman in the middle there. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, Julian. It's got to go on the, on the corner of coal, which uh, did stand up. Yes, I'm Tim Bellow. So, uh, oh, hello, Tim. Good, good to meet you at last. <laughs> so, uh, so on, the, on the question of coal, obviously you stand out uh, just a little bit from the crowd there. Um, obviously, coal is, is an extremely old resource, not, not, not just in terms of uh, how long it takes to make, but obviously how long we've been using it. And whether we've got you know, 10, 15, 150 years left of it, it is eventually going to run out. Surely, should we not be looking kind of forward thinking and investing in new technologies? We talk about nuclear power. Unfortunately, the debate very rarely uh, goes towards nuclear fusion, which is not is not particularly well talked about. But that's there's lots of options out there still. Thank okay, God. thank you very much. And last one, sorry, gentleman behind you. Uh, I think the approach to energy supply should be uh, to the public should be uh, committed to on, on a sort of triage basis where. Uh, those who, who, who can benefit most from it would uh, uh, gain from it. So it's, it's outrageous that old people are still dying in winter here. Um, we should be focusing on that kind of thing. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move on now. Um, so this is another show of hands, a quick fire question. We're moving on to the whole issue around food now. Um, so, quick fire question for the candidates. Um, do you support the production of consumption of GM food in the UK? Yes? Yeah, that's what I feel the same, yeah. 
Okay, two yeses if regulated. Any other yeses? Noes. Okay. Now the audience. Yes. Support yes. GM food. If regulated. And no. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next one, um, same format. Um, do, do supermarkets pay a fair price for milk? Do you agree with it? Oh, uh, that's the supermarket apostrophe, by the way. <laughs> exactly. You're fired. You're fired, Philip. <laughs> Supermarkets pay a fair price for milk. Okay, well. Yes, we do agree that supermarkets pay a fair price. No, you don't agree supermarkets pay a fair price for milk. <laughs> the audience again. Yes, you do agree that supermarkets pay a fair price. One? No, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> the rest. Thank you. Don't know. No, we don't have don't knows in here. <laughs> I'm afraid don't know is not allowed in the environment. Uh, another one, quickly, we need to move on. Um, right, this is about actually taking food for free that is being wasted. So this is what free is. So do you agree that freeganism is acceptable, i.e. saving good but expired food and other items from landfill by taking from, for example, supermarket skips. If you do? If you do agree, stick your hand. There's a, there's a bit of a difference though between food that's going to be wasted and food that's expired. Well, this is, food all, is food, this is all expired. food that's in the skip. This is what's food that's expired is, is wasted. Because so it's, it's not really once expired. it's got into the supermarket <laughs> skip, it is effectively well, wasted. Okay, it depends, it depends how much you want to believe the expiry date. Right? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but but the, point, the point of this question is that once it has been put in that skip, it is destined to go for disposal. Mm -hmm. So it's immaterial why yeah. somebody's decided that that's yeah. 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 Still a yes. So yeah. Okay. And, and no? Okay. Uh, and you guys? The audience? Yes. Do you think this is acceptable? And no, it isn't acceptable. Just one. Two. Two. <coughs> okay, now we're going to give you, um, 40, this is candidates, um, 45 seconds each on um, your understanding of the term sustainable food. And I'm going to start with Dominic. Oh, right. Um, well, sustainable food is basically food that can be produced without any further inputs other than what's in the land. So I would say a food that requires petrochemical fertilisers to be grown isn't sustainable. And also uh, factory farming, most of that isn't sustainable. In fact, most livestock farming isn't sustainable. You've got a big difference between things like hill farming for, for sheep, which is fine, that's carried on centuries, and then there's the big cattle lots that you get in places like the States, entirely unsustainable where the runoff just basically pollutes and kills everything around it. Um, I think that's my 40 seconds. Uh, yeah, well, you've, you've, you've come in under it, but that's fine, no problem. Um, ben? Ah, yes, absolutely. Um, food that isn't uh, produced in a wasteful manner and doesn't harm the environment in a general term. Um, and I'm happy to be put wrong there as well. Um, so two things that we're looking to do. We're looking to end uh, CAP, uh, payments uh, to lead on the reduction in waste and overproduction in particular and that's something that's going on in the reforms with the European Union depending on what happens with the referendum and also I was watching Country Farm the other night and watched what they were doing in France which I thought was a really interesting model of planting trees around uh, fields as well and they're leading the way on that so I think that might be a potential uh, way of us producing our food as well in the UK. Thank you. Lorraine. Right, thank you. Um, sustainable food. Um, you covered quite a lot of it, but um, organic food, food, food that's bought from local farms and shops, and also encouraging people to grow their own and supporting those who um, want to have allotments. So all about that, that continuous, the opportunity to continuously grow your own food as well, which I think would in, actually um, can come under the banner of sustainable food. Julian. 
Um, it may come as a bit of a surprise to you, I'm very much a fan of um, locally produced organic food, primarily because I quite enjoy eating it. I think it tastes a lot nicer and it's a lot better for my body than, um, than mass-produced food. And uh, I think that it's very important <coughs> that we create an economic environment and a regulatory environment where we can allow smaller uh, methods of food production, more local methods of food production. Um, when I go and speak to people who work um, either in food or catering industries, um, there's often a lot of frustrations from them as to why they're not able to, um, to do what they want to do. So I think that this, you know, this, this needs to be encouraged. Um, Thank you. Steve. My understanding of sustainable food would, would relate to how it's produced, how it's provided, and how it's consumed. In terms of how it's produced, for example, are, are pesticides used, or is it entirely a natural process? Uh, issues about water. It's ridiculous the amount of food that is grown in the middle of deserts, wasting huge natural resources, and in some cases leading to uh, local geopolitical conflict. Uh, in terms of how the food is provided, obvious issues about how it's transported, food miles, uh, where it's sourced from, is it local food? I, uh, I appeared in a chapter in a book uh, about uh, urban food growing, something I focused a lot on in previous life and I had a big success on. Uh, and I'm delighted the council now has its first ever food strategy looking at these issues exactly. And finally, how it's consumed. Is it processed food, unprocessed? Is it part of a healthy diet, etc. Okay, and um, Ollie. Okay, well, I, I believe it can be defined by food produced, um, distributed, and consumed with a, as little environment um, impact to the environment as possible. Um, we need to be prioritising local producers. I think perhaps we should look at long term as even quotas um, for supermarkets. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, now this is the last question on the subject of food, and we've got a contribution from John Chowler. Hi, <coughs> John. So we're going to do this. The, um, the candidates are going to answer first, um, and we're going to give them 40 minutes for this. Sorry, 40 seconds. <laughs> 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 yes, yeah, so just, just to make sure you're still awake and listening to what I'm saying. Um, and then we're going to have a short discussion, and then we're actually going to. Audience participation. Yeah. Okay, so. Great, yeah. Um, so, candidates, how will your party support the production and consumption of local food? Uh, I'll start with Lorraine. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a great supporter of our farm shops. We have some wonderful local farm shops around um, the city of Bar, and also they're a great hub as well because many of them are now putting in cafes. I continue to encourage children in schools to learn um, and the schools to teach children how to learn to eat healthily and encourage the, their lunches. Um, and now we have the uh, breakfast, breakfast in school and after school clubs continue to encourage them to provide excellent healthy food and not just snacks because it's just the end of the day before they're picked up to go home. So I feel it's very strong and it's about the education of the young people and the children in our society as well. There are few Lovely, generations. thank you very much. Um, Steve. Um, at a local level, I'm really quite, as I mentioned, the Liberal Democrat Long Council has produced the first ever food strategy this council has had. It prioritises uh, partnership working. There were probably some groups here who have worked on that as well. Uh, I'm really delighted and I hope that will make a big difference. Uh, we've also introduced uh, very widespread food recycling, as mentioned by one of the other candidates earlier. The reason why you can now uh, recycle and compost food in flats is because the Liberal Democrats have introduced it there, as we have also in businesses and schools. Nationally, I mentioned five green acts which the Liberal Democrats would bring in within the first two years of, of being in government. Two of those relate to this. One is around the Zero Carbon Act. The other one is around the Zero Waste Act, creating a, uh, a circular economy. And finally, on biodiversity... Thank you very much. <laughs> Julian? One thing you've got to remember about um, local food that comes from smaller producers is that these are small businesses. They're not huge corporations. Um, and in UK, we are very, very committed to the small business and lowering regulations on those and lowering taxes on those small businesses. Um, I'd urge all of you to have a look at the YouTube video of Jane Oliver talking about the way that these regulations damage local food production and uh, lead us to throw away huge amounts of um, vegetables that do not lead, uh, that do not meet the, um, meet the criteria. Okay, Ollie? Um, well, as I've already mentioned, I'm in favour of of looking at things like quotas um, for supermarkets, so we say every single supermarket in Bath 
um, has to produce 15% of the food that they have in stock at one time or has to, um, has to be, have been produced um, locally. I mean, it's also important to look at who's often providing the food that is produced locally. It's often provided by small independent businesses. Um, in Bath, these businesses are often put at a, a disadvantage as a result of competitors um, avoiding tax nationally. Um, one of the things that we'll do is clamp down on tax avoidance um, nationally, and this will hopefully help smaller local producers um, in local Thank areas. Thank you very much. Dominic? Well, the first and easiest thing to do is ensure that any public sector body buys local food wherever possible. Um, that's been made more difficult because of uh, the government giving away a lot of our schools. So we bring those back into public control, and then we'd be able to uh, make sure that they buy food in an ethical way. Um, we'd also discourage food miles, which by its very nature would mean people buying more food locally, so it's discouraged by use of taxes or other methods, um, lorries carting things around to distribution hubs and back. Um, we'd also measure waste that comes out of supermarkets and restaurants and things, and make sure that there is an incentive for, for businesses not to waste food, you know, and how that's done. You, know, you can charge them more for disposing of it. There's lots of ways creatively you can stop that. And the food that is wasted, we can reuse, give it back to feed or composting. Thank you, thank you. Ben? Uh, I just want to dispel that myth. I'm a school governor at an academy and they buy the majority of their food locally. Um, also, they've got an allotment as well, so they can do it if they're not run by the LEA. Uh, we need to improve food labelling so that people know where their food is coming from. Um, and that obviously has a huge benefit in terms of reducing our carbon footprint as well. As a part of my shop local campaign, which I'm running in Bath, I think the community can really sort of get involved with their local green grocers, which are struggling, I have to say. So if everybody spent an extra fiver a week in a local independent shop, hopefully a green grocer, that would be £340,000 extra for the economy of Bath every week. More jobs than the preservation of our green grocers. Thank so you very much. Thank you. Um, now, I'll take three co contributions, I like comments from the audience again. Um, Dave. Um, in 19, this is reference to milk. Uh, so this is the food part. In, in yeah. 1934, to solve just the problem that we have now about milk production, the Milk Marketing Board was formed. In 19... 84 was it? Margaret Thatcher couldn't bear the thought of a producer's co-op being successful so she legislated to have it closed down. So we're now back to the problems we had in 1934. So it's a very simple solution. Uh, the Milk Marketing Board produced a lot of uh, local local prosperity on small family farms. Thank you very much. Brilliant. And um, there were some hands at the back. Yeah, and then I'll come to you lastly. Yeah. <laughs> in, uh, in the French supermarkets recently, they've had a fantastic campaign to get people to buy ugly fruits and vegetables. And I think this is one thing we should also encourage in the supermarkets here and, and, uh, and get them to understand that they can't chuck away deformed vegetables. Thank you. And the gentleman in front here, but do you want to wait for a microphone? No, no, I'm all right. Yeah. But you need to stand up and address your comments at the back of the last yeah, no one. Um, no, I, I think uh, it's interesting to hear about um, most candidates on the panel are, are quite pro-EU, but TTIP is probably our most damaging, could possibly be the most damaging thing to our food production. Jane Oliver stood up against the EU, against this food labelling, as the chap said at the back, in terms of the, uh, the, the ugly food. Um, part of the reason why supermarkets don't do that is because some of the regulations have come from the European Union, so it's not all good. Uh, there is a lot of regulations. Uh, Thank you very much. Okay, um, that comes to the end of the food section. Can I just suggest we have a bit of a shuffle around and maybe chat to your neighbour for a minute before we move on to yeah. <laughs> One minute. One minute. Uh, Gen more general topic. Um, because as I do hard with microphones, it felt it was slightly unfair that Lorraine missed the last paragraph of her statement, which she's going to make now, and then we'll move straight into the next question. So Lorraine, your oh, floor you. for four, 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. So it was just the end of the last couple of paragraphs, really. Um, uh, and I, I mentioned about Astor and the City. So then I was going on to say, Education on the disposal of rubbish responsibly is really important, um, including recycling. More use of bio seagull proof bags across the city would help tremendously. 
And lastly, Bath has pioneered national initiatives such as Bath Farmers Market, set up in 1997. This was the first market in the farmers market in the country and was the result of the local Agenda 21. Buying locally is not only the chance to support local businesses, but it also reduces the mileage of food being transported. Thank you, Thank you, Lorraine. That's Thank you very much. Thank That's you very what I was going to say. Thank okay, you. brilliant. So we're going to move on to some questions about transport now. And this is for the candidates. Um, do you believe that VAT and fuel duty be applied to aviation fuel? If you are in Greek. Sorry? Yeah, it isn't currently. Sorry. So VAT and fuel duty aren't applied to aviation fuel. If you believe that that should be, then please raise your hand as candidates. Yeah. And no? Audience? Yes. And no. no. Two. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question relates to the A36, A46 Link Road um, around the edge of Bath. Do you support the building of that Link Road, candidate? Yes? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> uh, any no's? No. Audience? Yes? Oh, that's a good question. Um, and no. no. About half and half. Yes, it's just Okay, well, that's obviously a uh, point of much debate in Um Next question. Um, given that, this is for the candidates, given that current air pollution has been above EU limits for more than 10 years, and is unchanged in that time, should Bath follow London in proposing a city centre low emission zone? If you're in favour, raise your hands, please. It's in the Council's transport strategy, which was adopted in November anyway. So. Yeah. And no? Okay. Next one. Should Bath city centre be a completely vehicle-free zone? Now, um, I'm going to allow a bit of... Um, 20 odds, 20 yeah, seconds. a bit of elaboration on this. A bit of elaboration for you. What is the city centre? We didn't phrase this question. <laughs> so if you want to point out the... Um, uh, the if you'd like to tell us very quickly what do you feel about a traffic-free centre of Bath, please do. You yeah. have about 20 seconds. And we'll so start... Let's start with um, C. Uh, I would support, depends what you mean by city centre, I would support uh, the, a chunk of the historic core being traffic free, so for me that would be from Southgate to the top of Wilson Street, and from Bog Island over as far as Queen Square. The, the current Lib Dem Council is pretty much executing that plan, you'll see we've done some work outside Queen Square to enable temporary road closures, I hope people will see the world doesn't come to an end when we close two or three sides of Queen Square for some fantastic events, starting with the Bulls, this, this June tickets are out, uh, this July tickets are out tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, we do support it. It's nice to see that they've borrowed our um, pedestrianisation plan. Obviously, we some back. we 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 allow some vehicles like um, uh, uh, what you call them, invalid carriages and that sort of thing. Um, I think that's only fair. But generally, yes, we try and keep any vehicles. Great, uh, Julian. Uh, you won't be surprised to hear that some will answer no to this question. Um, I think that uh, huge amounts of our local way of life and our local economy in Bath um, still rely on the motor car uh, and delivery vehicles. And when you speak to an awful lot of just ordinary people out there who are not sat in meetings like this, they're just out there living their lives, they definitely don't want it either. Thank you. Ollie. Uh, long term, yes, um, but it's really important that we're able to provide alternatives for people as well. I think judging by the next question, I'll have a chance to talk about that in a second. You know, I don't believe that the local economy is dependent on cars. The local economy is dependent on people. Okay. Um, ben. Um, yes, I agree with what was set out in the public realm strategy, and there's been a number of those over the last 10 years, which is basically the geographical area which Steve mentioned earlier on, with mineral hospital services being moved up to the IUH. 
um, the access to that site no longer is uh, needed, so therefore you can actually create big public boulevards with the Mineral Hospital as the big uh, centrepiece of a return to community use. Great, and Lorraine, thank you. Um, yes, within within reason, um, because I agree with what's been said about obviously frail and um, disabled um, vehicles being able to come close to the city. Restricted delivery times to businesses, I think that's really important. And I do believe that some of those businesses that could have their uh, deliveries outside the city and share maybe one van that brings everything in, so that reduces everything. I think that's really important. I've visited Brunswick, our Twin Cities, several times, and apart from a small amount of public transport, um, everybody enjoys walking around the city, and it's really fantastic. The atmosphere is, is, is absolutely wonderful in that city. They've managed to do it, then I think we can do it. Thank you. And the next question um, is going to be introduced by Guy Bardo. Um, and this also relates to transport. Um, the candidates are going to have a minute, I know, 45 seconds each on this, and then we'll open it up for um, some audience participation as well. Hi. Modified question I was invited to ask is <laughs> Do you believe that bus transport quotes problems such as, but not necessarily? only traffic congestion, air quality, unattractiveness of cycling can be, quote, solved without demand management measures targeting car journeys. And further, what measures, if any, would your party introduce? Okay, so we'll start um, with on. Okay, so long term we have to be reducing the number of cars on our roads. At the moment there are too many cars on our roads in the city centre. Um, we have responsibility towards the environment do that. Um, the main issue at the moment is a lack of alternatives to <coughs> people. It's clear we have massive problems with congestion, which of course leads to air pollution. Um, a lot of that is brought about as a result of a poor transport system. This is a local problem, but it's a problem that has to be solved nationally. I am pleased we have a national solution. We're committed to integrating transport and applying a London Authority system to cities like Bath. That would mean councils have the power to control the cost of fares, which would lead to reduction. Um, recently, Labour Group on the council introduced Thank you very much. Um, quality contracts to help to get people yeah. on buses. And um, we're going to go to Dominic now. Um, well, obviously, demand management is, is a significant part of, of, uh, of help handling all these problems, so ignoring that for a minute. Um, yes, obviously, it's all about different forms of transport. I would like to see, and the party would like to see, buses used a lot more. Um, at the moment, it's ridiculous. The bus it costs me more to get the bus into town than it costs to drive and park for two hours. Absolutely ridiculous. Uh, the way it's because we've got a monopoly, so I'd like some municipal bus service that's run for people, not profit. Um, more use of the river, river taxis, very easy to do, pretty low cost. Um, segregated bike lanes on roads, it's ridiculous that London Road is too, too dangerous to cycle on. I mean, easy enough to segregate, make it a bit narrower. Um, as Lorraine said, uh, just a coordinated system for getting goods to shops, using electric vehicles and a distribution hub. All these things have uh, been done to some extent. That could be Thank nasty. you very much. And Julian? Uh, I don't really fundamentally believe in this concept of dictating to people how they should travel. Um, I think it's the role of a local authority to be able to provide the right infrastructure so that people can travel how they, um, how they like. On the subject of air quality, you know, it may surprise you to know that members of UKIP have also got lungs as well. And the air quality in <coughs> this city is something that I'm um, very concerned about. Um, I think there are there is an issue there with the fact that there's too much diesel used, and I think maybe we should examine one of the reasons why the private motor car um, has gone massively, massively away from petrol and over to diesel, which has made for, for the human breathing it the air considerably worse. Thank you very much, Leroy. Thank you. Um, I, I agree that the, as, a, as someone who used public transport said earlier, reduced bus fare prices for too long. One provider has had the monopoly, and a, and a town city not far from us, um, you can get into town for 50p. Well, that's fantastic for the economy, fantastic for the shops and the bars and the restaurants, because more people are going to want to use that public transport. I think that's really important. I've also covered a few areas in the earlier question. Um, also, the Easter Park, park and Ride, absolutely desperately needed. And also, if the highways agency could be brave enough to take um, 
to take a bypass um, over towards the Warminster Road, then we wouldn't have that dreadful amount of traffic coming into Bath and then going back out on the Warminster Road. That's urgently got to be done. The funding needs to come from government, you, and that has to be a priority next time round. Steve. How long do we have, sir? Um, 45 seconds. Okay, um, okay, I'll start that. Uh, yes, we can't keep pouring vehicles into our city centre. I mean, we just have to accept that fact. Um, the, the main uh, response I would suggest is, is providing really good quality alternatives. Uh, I'm really pleased that this council, the Liberal Democrat One Council, has passed the first transport strategy Bath has had in 50 years since the Buchanan Plan. Uh, that covers lots of things. I'll pull out two specific elements within that. Firstly, a parking rail in East of Bath. A parking ride bus will carry 50 people, get stuck in traffic like everybody else. It's not an ambitious enough scheme. We want to build a parking rail, Bath Parkway, by bringing back in the abandoned station at Bathhampton with a four minute journey time into Bath Spa, and government is really liking the idea. And linked into that, the idea of bringing back in the relief road uh, in ways where we ensure we don't induce further demand, but stop okay, thousands of lorries from down on the road thank every day. You. Thank you. I'm <laughs> The reason why the Buchanan Tunnel wasn't ever realised is because it was sort of pie in the sky thinking. So we've come up on the Conservative side with realistic plans in order to deal with the transport system and high levels of air pollution. And I'd actually like to hear from you, Guy, in a minute about your actual question before it was um, changed. But three things: we want to introduce segregate. Uh, sorry, we want to introduce sustainable transport measures, including things like segregated cycle paths to ensure people are actually getting onto their bikes. Um, also about integrating the bus services and introducing smart car ticketing on buses like they have in London. The prices ended up collapsing. We back the Metro West Phase 2 plans to open up a new Corsham and Salford railway station and the Chancellor has committed to looking at the feasibility of a new A3646 link road. Already been lobbying him. Hopefully we'll be able to deliver that if, of course, we run government too. Thank you very much. Um, now, I'll take, um, again, up to three... Um, contributions from the floor. So the first one that was right at the back. And again, you're limited to 45 seconds. Okay. Um, I was working on a council survey last, uh, last November um, and we were kind of questioning people about their, their travel and travel experiences on the buses and on the trains and what I experienced with, with asking people questions about their journeys we, we were asking the, the bare minimum and people were extremely upset about how first group are treating them a lot of the buses weren't running on time on, at, at the right time and the, the journey times were, were way too long people were paying far too much for their journeys as well and I, I think that First need to be kicked out of bar, per personally, and, and then needs to Thank be in the bus. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, oh dear. Um, well, like, so this is your question. Well, uh, just to summarise for the audience, that was yeah. six lots of no and none. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the um, I think this is an area for a lot of myth busting. A recent study done in Bristol looking at people travelling to shops found that shopkeepers believed almost everybody wanted to come by a car. When you ask the people what they wanted to do, about 70% of them wanted to walk or cycle. So we need to know what really people care about and not the myths. And last bit, yeah. Maybe. Um, yeah. Yes. Could I, could I just return, please, to the A3646 link? It's just that the A36 now is being closed for 16 weeks. And about seven or eight years ago, they closed the A36 on the Lumpy Stoke Hill for about six months. And basically, the A36 in the Lumpy Stoke Valley is sliding down into the river. And if you talk to the highways agency about the money they would have to spend to make sure that didn't happen, I suggest we support Wiltshire and send them down the 350. <laughs> 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 or you can actually, actually link the link that section, sir, on the, from the road to Bradford and Avon. Okay. Well, Bradford and Avon need to bypass first. Right. Can we, <laughs> obviously, a lot of people here, can we move on to the next question? Now, I'm going to change, this next question I'm going to change a bit. So I'm going to ask the candidates what they think should be built in Greenbelt. 
if anything. Just to, if anything, just to give it a little bit more interest. So I'm going to start with you then. Um, UKIP released quite a lot of very specific policies about protecting and green belt and green mm -hmm. spaces. Um, I don't really want to see any building there until all of our brownfield sites are being used up. Um, and we've got some very specific policies about um, lowering the costs of building on brownfield um, to incentivise developers to, um, to choose those sites over the greenfield sites. Um, I think we've got a lovely countryside and we absolutely have to, uh, to keep it preserved and keep it green. That's brilliant. You've got that now for 30 seconds, so that's what I'm offering everyone else. Um, it's slight difference to what I was going to answer in terms of a slide, so um, I'll change tack on Never this. Never trust an environmentalist. <laughs> <laughs> Always trust an environmentalist. So that's not me winning votes. Um, so yes, basically, uh, I, I mean, I'm not going to start trying to defend the council's um, position on building uh, on South Stoke Plateau, for example, but we need to be doing more, and I don't take the party's whip on this line. I've already said to two planning ministers, and we've fallen out over it, that we need to have more statutory protections for areas of outstanding natural beauty that currently have no statutory protections in the National Planning Policy Framework. And uh, we need to make sure that we build on the brownfield sites first and the green belt at the very last. And also, having those statutory protections will stop councils across the whole of the country looking at AOMB as the quick fix okay. solution. thank you. Just to remind everyone, the question was, what would you build on green belt? Um, Lorraine. Well, thank you. Um, well, we'll start with that because you've got the wind turbines, and um, I know that that's quite quite tricky. But if we're talking about how we're going to find alternatives way of, of providing energy, then I think we may have to look at that. Um, just going back on, if I could say something on brownfield sites, they do need to be utilised. Hartwell's garage, the land is there. I'd welcome that in my ward to have more housing. The government have uh, instructed the council they've got to build 14,000 new homes, and I've already got a site that might hold a few of them. Um, but it's about okay. encouraging people to, to do you. that. Moving on to Steve. Um, firstly, uh, we absolutely need more housing in this country. Secondly, not everything that's on built on is green belt land. Only 9% of the UK is actually built on, despite some myths that have been made around. But in terms of looking at your list, on genuine land, which is classified as green belt, I would not support large housing developments. I would support wind turbines, and I would support solar PV if it was rated 3B or below. So if it was low grade, low quality agricultural land. Uh, I think that pretty much answers that, Chair. Lovely, thank you. Ollie? Um, well, first of all, we, we do need more housing. At the moment in Bath, we are not utilising all of the Brownfield sites we, we have available. Um, one of the policies we put forward is use or, or lose um, initiatives. This is to tackle people who are sitting on large amounts of land which could be used for housing. Um, and that way, we should be able to utilise all Brownfield sites available. In regards to wind and, and solar, yes, um, I would support um, wind turbines being built on, on certain greenfield sites. Okay. There's a difference between thank areas of outstanding natural beauty and Thank you. And Dominic, again reminding that this is what Yeah, okay. Doing. I mean, the question does imply that brownfields have been used up, right? So, what would I see? Um, wind turbines, by their very nature, tend to be on sticky out of bits of land, which tend to be in green belt. So, I would support that. Solar PV actually isn't, doesn't have to be permanent. In fact, generally isn't a permanent installation. So, anything that's not permanent, I would be sympathetic to on green belt land, especially if it reduces our carbon emissions. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so, moving on then, um, another quick fire question. This is around climate change. Um, so three quick questions here. Um, so for candidates, do you believe um, climate change is man-made? Those of you who do, please stick your hands up. We have, partially, yes. Yeah. Partially, okay. And those of you who don't? Well, I'm just going to put my hand up a little bit, because I don't think you can answer this question in a yes or no answer. It's not, you know, it's not true. True. I, think that, um, I think that man is contributing something to it, but I don't believe that its contribution as much as some people believe. Because most of the, the papers, when you read them... Okay, but so, it's, so it's a difficult yes or no question. Yeah. It is a difficult yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but we're, we're trying to... Win. No, no. Yeah. 
Um, second question, is it realistic to limit global warming to two degrees? Do you believe that? Raise your hands, those of you do. It's a lovely thing to do, but I don't think it's achievable. Is it well, achievable? In which case you're both no. So those of you would say yes if it was achieved. <laughs> no, this is, if, is it realistic to limit, do you think it is realistic to limit global warming to two degrees? Just out of interest, what do you think? What do the audience think? Is it possible? Do you think it's possible to live in global warming to two degrees? Yes, yes it is. It has been for 18 years. Do you believe it's possible with severe changes and behaviour changes? Yes. Do you believe we're long time? <laughs> be the primary measure of the UK's success or should we consider other measures like happiness or the quality of life? And we're going to start with Julian. Do I believe that infinite economic growth is possible? No, I don't think it can grow um, infinitely. And I think that at some stage um, in our lifetimes we're going to have to look at how our um, money systems actually work. In the West we have got ourselves into um, a bit of a pickle and uh, you know we're not having debates about things like money creation whereas we should be there was actually one in Parliament recently first one in over a hundred years um, should GDP be the primary measure of UK success um, it's certainly a measure that you can measure um, it's very difficult to measure happiness and quality of life um, money doesn't make you happy but it certainly takes a sting out of being poor and um, I think that uh, the best things in life are often free, but um, being very, very short of money can bring, can bring misery. Okay, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, well, I've been nudged here to give you all a bit longer, so oh, right. we've got a minute. Okay, okay. Yeah, sorry. Oh, you had it, you had it. Oh, yes, I've had it. Lorraine. Thank you. Um, well, I'd like to start with the second bit, really. I would love it to be about happiness and, and quality of life because uh, it's not something that we all want to strive for with, within our families, our working life, getting that balance. Um, and uh, I think we all find that in these days, particularly nowadays, that uh, we don't get that work-life balance. But at the end of the day, you know, we, we, need, the, we need the finances, we need the money to, to survive. I mean, there's there's no other way around it um, but um, I can see where you're coming from with with regards to, to the question that you've asked believing the infinite gro economic growth is it possible well we've got uh, problems with the country's debt that needs to be addressed so there's a lot more could be added to to the answer to this question in more than just a minute but um, it would be nice at some stage to be able to to answer that more fully actually okay thank you very much I'm sure you'll have the opportunity during the next few months um, uh, um, yes, growth is really important. What's even more important than it is that it's been felt by everyone. At the moment, that's simply not the case. We're still at a cost of living crisis. Prices are still rising faster than wages for most people. And yet, the Tories and Lib Dems are telling us all that we should be feeling better off. Well, most people, unfortunately, are not. Um, so we've got to re-establish the connection between how well the economy do it, is doing and how well everyone else is doing. Um, I do believe that GD, um, sorry, that we should have looked at um, other measures of success like happiness and the quality of life. But whilst we've still got food banks, 
Whilst um, we've still got cuts having a disproportionate effect on, on the poor and most vulnerable in society, I'm afraid those readings are going to be rather low for a lot of people. Okay, thank you. Um, Steve? Uh, in terms of infidelic economic growth, do you think it's possible? No. The Liberal Democrats actually said this in 1979, and we were pilloried by a section of the right wing press for doing so. We actually said that economic growth was neither, endless economic growth was neither realistic nor desirable. It's common sense. We have a certain amount of resources on this planet. If we don't use it wisely, it will run out. Uh, in our Zero Waste Act, they mentioned the five green laws which the Liberal Democrats would look to introduce if we were in government again. One of those for a Zero Waste Act, we want to create a circular economy where you continually reuse the resources you have and take it around in a circle. On GDP, there are a number of uh, burgeoning new measures, better measures. GDP, its problem is it, it measures the wrong things and it effectively rewards and adds value to negative things. So war, great for GDP. Uh, but helping a neighbour out and saving the state some money that way, not registered at all. So we need a better way, whether it's the gross domestic happiness that you have in Bhutan or other alternative measures. And finally, linked into that, I'm a big advocate of complementary and alternative currencies. I was a director of a, of a complementary currency in, in London when I lived there, and it's something that I would, would like to see expanded, and I think Bath would be perfect for its own okay. complementary currency. Thank you very much. Ben? Um, answering, the first, answering the second question, money doesn't buy you happiness, but it certainly does help, obviously. Um, and we have reformed the measures of GDP under this government, and the Prime Minister has been quite vocal on his support for measuring things like quality of life and also <coughs> the happiness scale, which um, has been um, made to uh, be a little bit of a, uh, a humorous statement in most circles in um, politics at the moment. But I think it's very important that we do start measuring things like happiness. In terms of uh, infinite economic growth, the ultimate answer is no, because your resources run out at the end of the day. So you have got to be thinking about uh, managing your energy in, the, in a sustainable way and for the long term too. And uh, you can run out of money at the end of the day. And uh, all of this is completely wonderful about subsidising different um, environmentally friendly policies. But you can't do that unless you end up having a strong growing economy. Okay, and um, Dominic? Um, it's been interesting for me hearing all, all of the other parties saying that they don't believe in the economic, infinite economic growth when they pillory us when we actually are the only party that has this as a policy, a steady state policy. Uh, 1979, we've had um, since 1979. Um, well, okay, you don't talk about it. Um, so, of course, it's not possible. It's a finite system. Uh, we state it's not possible. We, we uh, advocate other alternatives and are ridiculed by the right wing press for it. Um, should GDP be the prime measure? Uh, no. Uh, I don't think any wealth measure is particularly accurate because you know, trickle down economics doesn't work. People, there's some very rich people getting very rich and the poorest are getting very poor. There's a million people queuing for food while the richest of the rich who grow up are eating themselves. So GDP is a meaningless measure for most people in this country. It doesn't matter how wealthy the country is if they don't see any of that benefit. So um, a happiness measure, yeah, that's a good one. I mean, there are lots, lots of measures really. Just having food and somewhere warm to live would be a good measure because we don't even need that yet. Thank you. Um, I'm going to open this up to the audience, another, again, another three, but I'm going to take people who have already spoken. Nobody wants to speak on this? I've already spoken. Okay, um, don't come back there. Uh, so just as a comment... Would you mind standing up? Uh, so just as a comment, uh, GDP assumes infinite growth, so isn't using an economic system that's based on GDP just completely useless? Thank you. <laughs> uh, we talk about happiness and we talk about industry and we talk about growth, but we're also talking about uh, fuels, uh, sustainability. But what about allowing local industry, local economies, and local sustainability forms of um, energy to grow, where people can have that connect between industry and energy, where at the moment we have the Chinese and the French building their power stations. And we talk about doing that land, or any land around us. If we had more local democracy, we could choose, and also feel that we had uh, an investment in what is, you know, made from the land around us. Thank you very much. Mm. Um, lastly, yep. Yeah. I think we could be able to speak very loud. Okay, well, Just wait, 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 wait. The microphone's fine. Pick with the stick. <laughs> right, is that better? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, and this is a comment just uh, directed at Ben actually, because he several times said that he distances himself from
from his party's policies. How do we know that if you got into power, we could trust you not to follow the party line? Um, can I, can I you come to back to that? Come back to that, because we, I think we'll We'll talk be about dealing that. with that quite at the end. Yeah. But a question. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, sorry, I'm just, so David introduced you, you're going to introduce this plus next question, which is about um, lobbying. There is concern that secretive industry lobbying is unhealthy for democracy and the environment. Also, politicians who derive outside income from these industries or who move directly from government to take up directorships or secret, secretive party donations from this industry distort scientific evidence and rational economic analysis. How will your party address these issues? Now, I'm going to give each of you four to five seconds. What I want you to focus on is whether or not you agree that this is an issue and what your party is going to do about it. Okay? Um, and we'll start with Ollie. Okay. Um, I, I do agree it's an issue. I'm proud that the Labour Party is um, funded largely by its members, but also the trade union movement. Um, trade union money is the cleanest money in politics. Um, I'm also really pleased that Ed Miliband is committed to putting an end to MPs having second jobs. We're going to put an end to MPs um, being able to take up paid directorships <coughs> and consultancy <laughs> positions whilst representing um, their constituency in Parliament, because it does need to bend to vested interest. It is damaging democracy. Okay, thank you. Oh, um, Lorraine. Thank you. As your MP, to me, that is the most important job, and that would be the one job that I would do throughout that five years representing local residents. I think it's absolutely disgusting that secretive industry lobbying takes place. Look at businesses in the city. You have to tender for work. You don't pay to, to get a contract, you have to tender against other companies. If we go for interviews nowadays, you know, stiff competition, sometimes you have to go back for a second or third interview. Why should these industries be able to, through the back door, be able to, to get their companies um, getting these contracts? I think it's absolutely disgusting. As your MP, I would lobby for everything to be cleared and secret lob lobbying should be absolutely abolished. Thank you very much. And um, Steve? Um, politics is, is an increasingly expensive business, I wish it wasn't so. It's effectively a financial arms race to keep up. Uh, the Conservatives have by far the most money, followed by Labour, who their single biggest donor is a hedge fund donor, uh, coincidentally. But it leads to very growing behaviour all round. We have to be very honest about that. We have to be very, very honest about that. Uh, things that the Labour Council look to do, we want to first see a limit on donations, no more than £10,000, to basically strike out the ability of large organisations to, to buy influence. Secondly, no second jobs. And thirdly, there should be clarity on any voting arrangements that candidates or MPs make. It was in the Independent recently that one of the candidates at this table has allegedly done a deal with a lobby in terms of hiding the vote on a particular issue. There should be no place for that in Bath, no place for that in British politics. Okay, Julian? I think it's really interesting when we hear from the three legacy parties, because this clearly, clearly is and has been going on for an awfully long time in our politics. And I think um, for anyone to deny that it's going on is, is absolutely futile. Um, we obviously look at what's going on in the European Union, where billions are spent on lobbying. Um, the EU is famous for churning out lots and lots and lots of regulations. The regulation machine never stops. Um, and what we find is that a lot of those regulations are written effectively by the huge donors that are uh, funding it. But I was actually having a little conversation, going back to more locally, with um, Tim over there on Twitter earlier. Um, you know, closer to home, I, I read a really interesting quote from the government's chief advisor I'm on sorry, sugar. I'm going to have to stop you. Oh, no. We all follow you. hear it. <laughs> we all follow you on Twitter anyway. Uh, ben, and can I remind you that we're talking here about what your party's going to do? <laughs> um, the party in government introduced the lobbying bill, um, which was basically to clamp down on uh, lobbying uh, behind closed doors, and that was uh, part of the coalition agreement between us and the uh, Liberal Democrats. Um, there are words within the party that we want to end things like second jobs, however, I have a, and I'm one of the people who won't have a second job, I can't 
uh, do this job uh, without sleeping at sort of two o'clock in the morning, without having a second job on top. Um, I disagree with Ollie in relation to unions being the cleanest money possible, because to be frank, if the unions come where, where does union money come from? from then? Um, <laughs> union comes from working people. It comes from on one side of trade unions. Your money comes from hedge funds. Ollie, 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 the city. <laughs> Bad. Hopefully that doesn't impact in my 20 seconds, there we go. And also I'm a fond advocate of something called the Right to Recall Bill, and that was a Conservative uh, manifesto commitment, and we want to make sure that residents, individuals, you guys, are able to hold their MPs to account during the middle of a parliamentary session. You're shaking your head, but actually okay. we have been pushing that. Thank, thank you very much, and um, Dominic. Um, the sad truth is money buys votes, and every party at this table apart from mine has taken money from uh, suspicious characters, I should say, without wanting to libel anyone. The view message. And then for the Greens. <laughs> and if, she, if it's proved that she's dodged an attack, we'll pay it back, as we have a track record of doing, even if people haven't, uh, who, people who've legally avoided tax, we still refund it, because we do not take dodgy money. Now, the only way to solve this, really, is to have uh, public funding for political parties. Yeah. Yeah. If, yeah. If, if, if you have anyone giving you money, they are buying your policies. We've seen this with the Tories taking private money from, uh, from uh, private health care and selling yeah. from the NHS. We see it in all the other parties to a greater or lesser extent. We don't think it's right. If you, if you depend on money for corporates, then you're going to make rules for them. You should be making your laws for the people. The people should be paying you to, to, to maintain your party via the taxes. Um, any contributions that people want to make on this issue? No, has you already, already contributed? Yeah. I don't think you are allowed to ask questions. Is not surely a trade union movement the biggest lobby, one of the biggest lobbying movements in the country. So therefore, uh, to me, there should be no link between a trade union and any principal party. Uh, and certainly, also the public funding, which of course was mentioned, um, should we not maybe, as, as one member said, that the uh, party should be funded by the membership. Yes, very good. Uh, more members, more members, more members. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> Thank you very much. I think you've already asked the question. I have, yeah. 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 Maybe a lady could speak there. That's what we usually agree with last. We haven't heard from a lady for a while. Sorry? Maybe a lady could ask a question. Yes. Well, I can't make the question. Judith. Oh, there it is. Forest Farm. Now, we've got more than one. Political lobby, by definition, destroys democracy. I can't give. Uh, 100,000 pounds for political change, I've only got one vote. I do not want to live in a marketocracy, I want to live in a democracy. It should be illegal. Thank you. Judith. I just wanted to comment on the remark about um, industry lobbying in the EU. We're having spent seven years of my working life lobbying for better consumer rights in the EU. I happen to know that actually the European Commission and the other institutions of uh, the EU do listen to other voices besides the, the moneyed uh, corporate lobby. And in fact, we managed to get uh, have huge influence because one of, the, one of the myths about the EU is that they have this massive installation of, of uh, bureau bureaucracy and they, they don't. It's actually smaller than many London boroughs. Uh, and they rely very heavily on input from the national, from the member states, to make better laws. They put out a draft, and the likes of me and, and people like me help to make them make the, the law better, so that what comes out then is decent labelling or food hygiene or a food law or whatever. But I think it's, it, it is very wrong to accuse uh, um, the EU of being responsible for this secret <coughs> industry lobbying. It's actually more transparent. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Comrade, yes. Okay, um, there is a preamble to this, uh, and it comes from personal disappointment, I suppose. So, uh, and as I'm helped set this up, I'm going to take the liberty of asking for doing the whole thing. Um, when David Cameron and the coalition were elected into power, they proclaimed that this was going to be the greenest government ever. 
<laughs> and yet, two years later, <coughs> we have David Cameron saying it's all green crap. Now, my worry is we hear fine words from these, uh, and we have heard some extremely interesting comments from these people. But my question would be, what are the environmental policies you hold most important? And would you vote against your party if the policy went against your principles? So it's a, a continuation of that. It's very easy to say things, but what would you vote against when push comes to shove? Um, I'm going to give you um, a minute for this, each of you. Um, and we'll start with Ben. This right there. <laughs> um, I was also very disappointed about the green crap um, argument that I've seen in the, in the papers. Um, I, I've worked for a long period of time with people like Zach Goldsmith and my own party on things like anti-air pollution uh, caused by Heathrow and that's impacted on my understanding of environmental issues quite heavily and obviously the impact in Bath of air pollution levels has also been very high. Um, you asked a question, I, thought a, I think it's a really important uh, question actually because the fact that trust in politicians is incredibly low at the moment and I could just be sitting here and telling you what you want to hear in order to ensure that you end up voting for me, okay? And I completely appreciate that. But you know, there are things that can be done to ensure that there is greater accountability in uh, Parliament. Things like the right to recall bill, I have to say I think is a very, very important step forwards. And also I think it's really important that when your candidates are coming before you to ask for your votes, that they actually have a plan. And that I've got a six okay, point plan sorry, for that. I'm going to answer the question. Well, no, I'm going to answer the I, question. Well, that, no. well, people can make their own judgments, can't they? Um, but I would like to remind everyone that what you're focusing on is what policies are most important to you and what you've prepared to go against your party for your principles. Um, Lorraine. Thank you. Um, can I take the second part first because yeah. I'm not actually a part of yeah. a party? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, as your MP, I will have the freedom to vote for policies that are right for the residents in this wonderful city. I will have the freedom to vote without a party telling me how I should vote. I will be the MP who will not make U-turns and I will be the MP who will listen to residents. I have strong principles, hence why I made the decision in January, a big decision, to become an independent. And to move on to the first part of the question, um, you know, national support on clean and cheaper public transport, again, that's something I feel very passionate about. As I said, I'm not a driver. And the UK has the means to be an example of eco-friendly uh, country for the world, fighting climate change and creating a sustainable um, economy. And they go hand in hand, and we have to think about our health and the environment. Thank so I feel you. very passionately, as an independent, Thank that you. I could do uh, that. Steve? Just one minute, Chair. Yeah. Okay. Uh, split in half. Uh, the environmental policy is hold most important at a national level. I think energy is absolutely key. I'm a huge advocate of moving away from the system of having six multinational drug dealers who give us something that we can't live without. I want to see more decentralised, community-owned, locally produced, micro-generated energy, and I want to see communities having firm control over that, the price is sold at, and where the profit goes. At a local level, transport would be the big, uh, the big environmental policy I would hold most dear. We really have to, it's the one thing holding Bath back from being a fantastic city, we really have to tackle transport. Finally, yes, I would absolutely vote against my party. Uh, the first meeting I had after I was selected with bear in mind the chief whip of the party in government, the local chair and the leader of council, I gave a list, I should give you my list, I won't dodge the question like some other people. I said I will not support fracking, I will not support nuclear power, but primarily because I believe it's illiberal and a centralised power in the hands of six companies. I will not support the budget poll on the current evidence, and I will certainly not vote for nuclear weapons of any sort at any time. Thank you very much. The thing about all this is, is that every few years, we all come out, don't we? We sit here and we listen to, to this sort of stuff going on. And uh, those of you who are old enough will know from bitter experience that you are given promises and then uh, you're normally let down on those. The, uh, the candidates from the three main parties will be whipped and uh, we often see a lot of uh, broken promises as a result of that. To answer the second part of the question, um, for me, maintaining our the environment that we live in, you know, our green spaces, um, you know, maintaining our countryside, having clean air to breathe, um, not being surrounded by rubbish in the streets and the sort of lack of hygiene that that, uh, that, that brings. Um, those are the things that are really important to me. And as a UKIP MP, I wouldn't be, ever be subject to a party whip. 
So um, if anything ever conflicted with my principles, then um, it wouldn't be a problem for me to vote against it. Okay, uh, Dominic. Okay, I'm going to start on the second part as well. Um, again, the Green Party isn't whipped. Um, to be quite honest with you, nobody joins the Green Party to, uh, for a career. Um, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not going to run the government. And so you can be assured that I'm standing because I genuinely believe in everything we say, not because I want to be promoted to some minister of nonsense. So, <laughs> so I, yeah, I will vote against my party if my party has a line I don't agree with, but I don't disagree with any of them. Right. Policies, I think the most important one we've got is tax tradable carbon quotas. I think that's so important. It basically, it's a set of a, a mechanism in place for people to limit their own carbon through their own will and you know, people who do well to earn money from it. It's just such a brilliant idea. Lots of economists say it's brilliant. It's a good way to get carbon quotas down. Lots of other things we do. Obviously, I think it's vital to insulate homes. It's a, sh it's a sh shame this country that people die of the cold. We should put insulation in the homes and we would do that. We would also bring energy back into local control public hands. No profiteering from things you need. That's energy and water, all those things. Nobody should be making profit from those. That should be run as a service for the people. Thank you. And um, Alex? Well, first and foremost, my principles are everything. I'll stand by them at all costs. Um, the biggest priority for me is tackling climate change. The Labour Party wants the UK government to lead the global fight against climate change. Part of our domestic plans, as I've mentioned, involve um, decarbonising our energy production by 2030, expanding the Green Investment Bank, continuing and expanding investment in renewables and investing in transport infrastructure as well. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Is there anybody who's got a burning desire to tell candidates what they feel is their most important issue? Gentlemen there? Tim. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, the last general election, um, I wanted to vote Green, but instead I voted tactically, um, and I very much regret it. And so my question is, under what circumstances, if any, would you consider <coughs> Tactical voting to be democratic. This question is for the candidates. Yeah. We're not doing that. We're happy to answer it. Let me answer it. Ask us after. Okay. Off you go. Quick. Since, since it was, uh, since you want to vote green, I would say always vote for what you believe. Look what we've got. We've, we've got an MP now who's voted with the Tories and everything. That doesn't change, does it? I mean, basically, we've got a Tory MP in all but name. Um, if this happens, it looks like the next government won't have a, a majority, so we'll have another coalition. It looks like the Lib Dems will probably be in that coalition. So let's face it, we might end up with another Tory Lib Dem coalition. And if you vote Lib Dem there, what are you going to say to yourself? Oh, well, I've helped aid another right wing government. You know, no, don't do it. Vote for what you believe. If you vote for what you believe in, we, you know, we're actually polling pretty well. If you look at uh, vote policies, we're actually the most popular party in Bath, if people vote for what they actually believe in. If everyone actually just votes for what they believe in, we'll win. You know, it's that simple. Thank vote for what you believe in. Yeah, the tactical voting hasn't worked. People voted for the Democrat to keep the Tories out. Instead, what we've got is one of the most right-wing governments in history. We have the bedroom tax, privatisation, of the NHS, £9,000 tuition fees. Vote for what you believe in. Tactical voting hasn't worked. Right. Thank you. Um, I, I think I covered slightly just now in the earlier question that um, I stood by my principles after being very disillusioned and I came out and went independent because I truly feel very passionately about my home city of Bath, the city I want to represent. And of course, after this uh, election, there'll be a lot of small parties, a lot of independents, and those votes are going to be wanted by the major parties. So we will have the opportunity to vote. I would have the opportunity to vote for policies that are right for the city of Bath. Uh, ben? I don't want people to tactically vote. I don't think that's going to be a, a surprise and stand by the courage of the conviction. I'm very sorry I didn't answer the last question either. I ran out of time. I apologise. It wasn't deliberate. Um, but I would actually personally um, change my... Uh, sorry, I would actually tactically vote if I believed in something with, say, for example, we were a couple of ago, with Labour on the anti-fracking bill. And I would tactically vote against my own government on that basis. So that might answer the last question as well okay. as this one. Um, Julian? Uh, we have the first past the post voting system uh, that's locked in the, uh, the three major parties to a, an entitlement of power um, and it has made an awful lot of people go out and tactically vote and people are still thinking of tactically voting now. Um, thank God for the internet so people can check the voting record of their MP. When you speak to people in Bath who voted for the Lib Dems um, 
and then since check Don's voting record, they um, they also they never vote again. So I think it's time that we started looking at an alternative system, you know, maybe a PR system, um, something you know, something different yeah. that's going to um, allow better democracy. That people should be able to vote for what they truly believe, as opposed to this tactical one of the main three. Um, you would see if we did move over to this. You would see a hell of a lot more UKIP and Green MP. Okay. Well, and independent. Yes, no. Steve. Um, sorry, sorry. I, I wish more people across the country had the wisdom that the people of Bath did in terms of their MP. Then we would have had a very different type of government. Sadly, under the current voting system we have, it actively encourages tactical voting because it's a binary choice. Firstly, the Liberal Democrats are very clear from the day one when you find out we want to change the system bring in a fairer voting system as part of a suite of overall changes within politics. The like to hear that YouTube now finally agrees, having opposed uh, the AV system when it came through. Secondly, I would say take a view on the individuals you see in front of you. You don't vote for parties, necessarily, you vote for people. Um, the hard reality in Bath is because of a mixture of the demographics of the city and our voting system, if the reality is if you don't get a little Democrat MP, you will get a Conservative MP. You will get a Conservative MP who is pro Fox hunting, who is pro Tritons, and who will join a party full of kind of skeptics. Finally, so finally, don't take my word. Finally, please don't take my word for it. Look at independent pundits who are saying who, who will win in this constituency, and look at the bookies who have their money on the line. They're like 20% out um, in Rochester. Okay, that brings us to the end of the evening. Um, I'd like to join you in first in thanking the candidates, um, and then I'll ask them to thank you.